from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22 to 26. God's word reads thus. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, being jealous of one another. You may be seated. Great servant and power to be complete. Once we decide to become born again, and the Holy Spirit is, has now regenerated our spirit and lives within us, the Holy Spirit should have an impact and effect on our lives. And what's written here in, in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia is, we should be bearing fruit based on the Spirit being within our lives. Now, fruit in this is singular. I know when I was a child, he used to say the fruits of the Spirit. But in the Greek, it's singular. It means the fruit. That means all these things, all these attributes are the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, as we move through life, people will see through us all these attributes that, that start to happen. And this is the product of the new and divine life that's been implanted within us when we become a believer. We live in the Spirit that is, we derive our spiritual life from the indwelling spirit. In other words, we should start to live as though the spirit of God lives within us. And that motivating force from that spiritual life is what produces the fruit of the spirit. People get to see on the outside what's happened on the inside. When folks come around you, they should be impacted by the fruit that you display. When, if God has truly worked in your life, people should look at you and yeah, see exactly. Jesus. See, the word Christian means Christ-like. That means I'm like Christ. You know, some folks think, well, I was born in America, so I'm automatically a Christian. No. Sorry, it didn't work that way. And that did happen when, when the Romans decided to adapt Christianity as the, the, the state religion, folk instantly became Christians. Well, they didn't really, but, you know, they were part of the church, so they were Christians. Well, no, there's, there's more to it than just being born into a church or going to a church or being part of a religion. You have to literally believe in Christ to truly be a Christian. You have to allow the Holy Spirit inside of you to start to guide you. And as we look at the fruit that Paul talks about here and the attributes, we need to understand what they mean. They're just not words. There's meaning behind those words as far as what God is expecting. When he says love, he's using that word agape, which we've heard before. That's the love of God. And it's only produced in a heart that's been yielded to the Holy Spirit. You can't have the love of God come out of you if God is not in you. Yeah. Amen? Amen? You know, when we say we love someone, and sometimes we, you know, when I remember, you know, you always used to write those little love notes to the little girl you liked in school. I love you. Do you love me? Yes or no? <laughs> she'd circle the yes. And you'd feel all good. She'd, she'd write you a note back, and we think we're in love. Hmm. That's not the love we're talking about here, because you know what happened as soon as somebody else caught her fancy. She was over writing them a love note. Like, well, I thought you loved me. Uh, you know? Uh, then as we got older in the high school, we were falling in love and getting given promise rings and promise bracelets. And I don't know what we were promising, but we were promising something. <laughs> and then we'd break up and we'd toe off from the floor. <laughs> Calling them names just the other day you liked them. But then they, they, we all break up and suddenly you tell your friends. You know, how no count she was. She's telling her, her, telling her sisters, girl, I'll tell you what, he's a scoundrel. Then you find out that one of your friends liked her, was glad y'all broke up. So he, she could make that move, you know, he or she, they, they jump right in. Hey, man, I thought you were my friend. You know, hey, man, you don't want to 
Amen. 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 That's not love. That, that's you know, that's affection. We we will so most of the time let's be real with lust. Amen. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I was I'm human too. And then finally we found someone that we loved enough to say, I'll share my life with you. And then we start to understand what real love is. So I always say, if you really love someone, you've got to love the good, the bad, and the other. And you need to really follow it. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the other. Call it out. And I'm going to tell you what you really need to love is the bad and the other. Amen? I mean, think about it for, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You got to roll over and they got morning bread in the morning. And you still got to love them. Still got to love, you know, still got to be there. And then when you have children, you really find out about agape love. When they start doing stuff they shouldn't do, and you, you, you feel like killing them, but you still got to love them. And you just get the paddle out and whoop that. Y'all don't do that? Whoop that we in? Anyway. But you, you love them. And you have to let your children know you love them. Despite what they do. That's the God-like love. That's long-suffering and all that. But, but that, that's the type of love God is talking about. That God-type love. Because if you think about it, God really puts up with a lot of stuff from us. Yes, he did. Yes. And still loves us. Mm. Then you have joy. The Greek word there is char. That's, that's the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Holy Spirit, that joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's not that stuff in the joy juice we get. Y'all know what joy juice is, right? Mm. Mm. But, you know. <laughs> Which way is up? How many of y'all saw that movie? Man? Talk about no, no joy juice in church paper. <laughs> Amen. This is a different type of joy. It doesn't come from external things. It comes from internal. Is that joy of the Lord. And there's a peace. Not a peace with God, but the peace that we have. But a peace of God in our hearts. It's that tranquility based on the consciousness of the right relation to God. I know I'm with God. And I'm bound together with God. And I have a peace that passes all understanding. You, you go through all kinds of stuff and people see you're at peace. Like, man, what in the world is going on? Man, he's going through all kinds of stuff. He's got a peace. And we say, why are you so peaceful? He say, I don't understand. Well, actually, if you're a believer, you do. You're the Holy Spirit inside of you. Operate in peace. And in that, they should find that peace inside the church. When people come to visit the church, they should find peace, not war. But sometimes in church, folk come in to visit, and they see a war before they get in. Man. Folk fighting over seats, getting all upset because somebody didn't wear something they thought they should. Sister so and so wore my dress, you know. You know. Brother so and so sat in my seat, you know. Pastor didn't smile at me. Probably wouldn't even look at you, but yeah, you know. Amen? And you can tell that. How many of y'all ever been in a church like that? Amen. Where you can feel that. Amen. Lord, what's going on over here? Amen. People should feel that peace when they get around you. They should be peaceful. I, I, I drove a school bus for a period of time, and every morning and afternoon, I would pray over every seat on my school bus. And I didn't know it was having any kind of impact. Of course, people who substituted on my bus were like, man, your bus is so calm. And, and one day, some of the high school students, you know, the last three or four folks who get off the bus, they'd always move up from the back of the bus. <laughs> And, and finally, one of the young girls looked at me and said, are you a Christian, Mr. Martin? And you know, we're not supposed to talk about God and schools and all that, right? I said, well, yeah, I am. She said, I can tell. She says, you know, there are, there are days I get on your bus where I'm just ready to act up and just act a fool. And I get on your bus, and the minute I get on your bus, it's like a peace comes over me, and I feel, feel good. She says, I, you know, I, my dad's a minister and stuff. And, you know, I act all crazy, but I know God was. And I sat there and thought, wow, just praying over the seats was creating peace on my bus. That's it. Think about that. 
If you've got situations at work to folk out in the fold, well, maybe you should go there and see, come early, pray over that sin, and get some peace up in there. Amen? All right. but, but that's what Christ expects us to do. Long suffering. That's steadfastness. That means the forbearance and patience. We don't have anger, thoughts, revenge. We, we put up with a lot when we're saved because we see the world the way God sees it. See, God used to get mad at the children of Israel, but he always kept coming back. Oh, I'm going to forgive y'all again. One more time. That's, that's that patience we have. We're not trying to get revenge because we understand God is working on folks. Oh, you know how it gives me some long suffering? When I recognize what I used to be like and how God was patient with me. And then I look at somebody else, like my children or someone, and realize, you know what, I need to just go ahead and take a chill pill at this point. I tell you, I did way worse than that. Amen? Amen. That's that long suffering. Gentleness, that kindness. That should, that should penetrate everything. People should feel kindness from Christians. Unfortunately, in the world today, in America, how many folks really feel kindness from the church? People know what we're against more than they know what we stand for. Listen to some of the Christians that get on TV shows or blog or what. Some of the most hateful stuff I've ever heard comes out of the mouth of Christians. Here's something to remember. Sinners felt comfortable coming and talking to Jesus. Let me say that again. Sinners felt comfortable coming to Jesus and talking to him. Because he was kind. <laughs> Read it in the Gospels. When Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, was, was up in the tree trying to see us, he had looked at him and said, Man, you've been ripping folks off, and, and you've been getting mad, you need to repent of your sins. And, and Is that what Jesus said to him? He said, Hey, come on down, I'm coming to your house to eat today. All right. What? Hmm. What? You mean he didn't preach about what he had done? No. And then because of the kindness, what Zacchaeus voluntarily said, you know what, God? I'm going to pay back everything I've stolen from. Right. That's the impact you can have on someone's life by being kind. You don't know who you're dealing with on a daily basis, and the kind word you tell them or the kindness you show them can be what they need to get them through that day. Yes. Can, can be what they need to turn their life over to Christ because they see something in you they haven't seen before. That's it. Yeah. I, had, I used to be judgmental because you know, I, you know, I was always so on fire to tell folk about their sin. No, that's not my job. Mm. My job is to show the love of Christ to give them an opportunity to tell God about their sin, to repent of their sins to God so he can fix their life. So people want to come talk to you because they see kindness there. The world needs kindness. It's a cruel world out there. They need kindness. That gentleness, goodness. How many folks know really good people? I mean, folks are so good that you like to be around them. That's that quality that, that we're ruled by the aims of what's good, that moral worth. When you get around folks that you know, and you, they're so good, you get convicted of your wrongness when you get around them. Yeah. All right. Hello? Hello? You mean? All right. Is that the way we are? <laughs> that the way the church is? That folk were so good that people get in the light and they just, they just want to give their heart to God? They want to turn themselves over to God. If you're one of those people, people seem to always come and tell you what's going on in their lives, the bad stuff, don't be angry about that. They see the light of God in you. And when they see that goodness, they want, they want to repent. And your job then is, okay, well, then we could, there's somebody who can help you take care of that. Then let me talk to you about Jesus. Sometimes they say, man, folks always come and tell me your problems. Well, that's because they see something in you. You have Christ inside of you. And when that's going coming out, when that fruit is... At, they're, they're tasting that fruit and going, man, this is something I haven't seen before. Don't, don't be mad about that. Be happy. That's the Holy Spirit working through your life. Faith. 
This is that faithfulness, that, that fidelity that's produced by yielding to the Holy Spirit. It's a different type of faith. It's not that the Lord is my shepherd type of faith. It's that my God, my God, why have you forsaken me type of faith. When stuff is going bad and you're hanging in there and you're going through persevering and folks can't figure out why, it's because you have a faith that's not about anything other than you believe in God, you know what he said, I know he's getting me through this. That's faith. That's a real faith. Meekness is about gentleness control. I talked about this before where you, you, you're strong. It's like the bit in a horse with all that strength that bit controls that horse. That's where you, you know the power that God's given you, but because of God, because that bit the Holy Spirit is in control, folks can see despite that power that you're under control. You're not using that against people. There are folks who want to pray against folks. We're not supposed to pray against people. We're supposed to pray for people. And we know that the Holy Spirit's empowered us to do a lot of things, but we're supposed to be using that power to glorify Jesus, to bring people to Christ. Temperance. This is self-control. This is people who learn how to control their bodies like an athlete has control. You control your desires. That means you see things that maybe you desire to do, but you decide not to do it. It may be something as, I'm not going out to that place I go to get in trouble all the time. I just make the decision I'm not going there. I have control, self-control. I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to guide me versus my desires. And when we live in this, let me first say, this doesn't happen overnight. So if you're not meeting this right now, don't feel bad. I'm still struggling with a lot of this myself. As I read through this, I go, ooh, Lord, at times I don't have temperance. All right. You know? Yeah, I know I'm not supposed to be eating fried foods, but you know, some of bring a little chicken from bushes with some sweet tea that I know I'm not supposed to be drinking either. <laughs> and I know that I already had some golden chicken on Sunday last like, oh. week. Amen? Amen. We're, we're working, the Holy Spirit's working through us to complete us. This, these, this fruit shows completeness. And when we get together as a body, that folks should see that within the church. All these attributes should come out. They should see us living lives of self-control, living lives of, of temperance, living lives of faith, living lives of peace and joy. They should see all that happen. And if I'm a little better than one of those attributes than someone else, then I help them learn how, to, how, I, how I got there. Amen? That's what the church is about. See, the church isn't just something you come on Sunday, check it off on a list. It's where I get fed. It's where I get built up. It's where I talk to my, my fellow warriors and say, hey, how are you going through this that way? And we should be able to, hey, let me show you. This is, this is what helped me. And then I, oh, wow, I'm going to try that myself. You know, I'll give you an example, losing weight. How many of y'all want to love to lose, lose weight? Amen. Amen. I, I put two hands up in that one line. <laughs> but there, there's, there's a method to it. You have to intake less than you burn off. Or how did that? You have to burn off enough so that you can lose. I, I found out that I, I have to do 1,800 calories a day between intake and exercise to lose a pound a week. And I need to count calories. I used to not do that. I thought it was crazy. I count calories for it. Well, there's a method to the madness. You want to lose, you got to cut things out, like soda pop. How many of y'all love soda? Sweet tea, you know? I love it too, but you know, too much of that is not good for you. You have to offset it with some type of exercise. That could be just walk around a block a few times. That may get be Arnold Schwarzenegger. But just by you know, get up off the blessed assurance and walk. You know, when you park at Walmart, don't park right next to the door. Park a little ways out so you have to walk a little bit. Amen. Hello. I mean, we you know, I, I still got some weight I need to lose. I, I, I said, okay, I lost quite a bit here, but I'm still not there. I got, I, you know, I, I started counting calories, used my dog on iPhone, and oh, Lord. Now, I realized I got my calorie intake down, but now I got to exercise. 
Uh, so I gotta, you know, do some walking and some push-ups and sit-ups and, you know, sometimes just, just, you know, doing little things like, you know, saying that, that great gospel hymn, I push myself away. I push myself away. You know, when, you know, when you're tempted to eat that extra value meal, cut that thing down to the kids' meal. Amen? Just intake less and find a way to exercise. That's how you, you know, that's how you extend your life a little bit. I know guys used to play football and stuff, man, they used to have all the exercising down. They used to eat a lot because they were burning a lot off, and then they stopped burning it off. Uh -huh. and big as a house. So, you know, that's, that's too bad. Now remember that. Amen? That's part of what we should be thinking of. Is that part of self-control? This is the temple of God. And I should be doing what I can to use the temple in the right way and feel good about what I'm doing. People should see in me God through everything I do. Amen? Amen. But i got to share those things with folks. I just can't keep it to myself. If I found something good, i got to help somebody else with it. God is moving through my life in a certain way. I have to tell other folks about it. When Janine was going through her, her cancer treatment, I was able years later to help somebody else when they were going through and be able to sit down with a husband and say, this is what's going to happen, brother. This is, you know, this is what you're going to be feeling. And, and I called back a few weeks, man, I'm so glad you talked to me. Because he was feeling exactly what I told him he was going to feel. That's, that's what we do as believers. When we conquer something, we help somebody else conquer it too. Because we want all of us to be more than conquerors. But people need to see that. And when folks see that we give of ourselves, they see the fruit of the Spirit in operation, they want to come be with that. Amen? So, well, here's the Holy Spirit's ministry. He has two, two things he does. He operates in our life and gives us victory over sin. Because Jesus, when he died on the cross, gave us that victory. And he produces, through our experience, the fruit of the Spirit. So here's how, here's how we get that fruit in operation. First, we have the desire to live like Christ. That has to be the desire of our heart. That has to be something we want to do with a passion. I don't know about you, but there are times I just I get tears. I'm thinking, God, I just want to live like you. And I don't find myself measuring up to God. It, it bothers me. But have that, when you have that desire to live like Christ, the Holy Spirit really starts to work. Second, we've got to learn to depend on the Holy Spirit for the power to live that life. We can't do it on our own efforts. We have to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. Help me get through this thing. It's like that old hymn, lead me, God, lead me a long way. For if you lead me, I will not stray. Lord, help me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. And when we do that, we step out on faith, we live that life, and God starts to fulfill and work through us for God. But we got to let him lead us. We have to let him guide us. We have to let the Holy Spirit empower us to be complete. Because when we get to the point where that fruit of the Spirit becomes evident in our lives, becomes ever in our churches, then we start to move in a life that's designed to empower us, to be what God has called us to be. It's not hard to do. We just have to do it. You have to want to do it. And then constantly work with the Holy Spirit to get it done. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to your feet.